All right, well, good morning. How's everybody doing? I think I need to be turned on just slightly. Thank you very much. All right, well, my name is Chris Pleckenpole, and I'm the pastor here at Wells Branch Community Church, and I am so glad to be here with you today. Uh, if you're just joining us, like this is your first Sunday here, I'm extra pumped that you're here. We are right in the middle of a, an eight-week series called After God's Own Heart. And um, essentially what we've been talking about is this thing of where God is not looking for external performance, but what he's looking for is that what drives what you do, which is the heart. And uh, in 1 Samuel, that's the book of the Bible, uh, God made this guy named Saul king over Israel. And the problem was is he was all about himself. He might have done, attempted to do right things, but the motive was always self-promotion as opposed to God promotion. And so God takes Saul off the throne, and he anoints David, but it doesn't happen immediately. In fact, for about 15 years of David's life, Saul is looking and pursuing to kill David. And so that's sort of where we've been walking through is the story of, of, of that exact story. And, and this thing of like David is a man whose heart was just totally, fully devoted to God. And um, one of the places that we're going to see, we're going to talk about like what it looks like to have this this heart of a, of a covenantal heart. Because one of the things you think about uh, when you think about love and, you know, relationship is marriage. In fact, um, here's a shameless promotion. Uh, we are have this weekend at Hill Country Bible Church, Pflugerville, we're doing a marriage weekend, all right? So this is, I still do conference. And one of the reasons we're doing this is people still keep getting married. Uh, it turns out, like, every Christmas, this is what's so weird, and, but people get married, like, on Christmas Vac- I'm not sure why. They- it's kind of like one of those things where you, like, you do a destination wedding because you really don't want anybody to come. But you have to invite them because you're friends and you're going to have like awkward relationships and connections if you don't. So you put it like on Christmas where everybody already has plans. And so thank you for doing that so I can't come to your weddings, those of you who are doing it over Christmas. Uh, but uh, there's this reality of like a bunch of people are getting married. And the, and the thing about it is when you get married, there's this um, awakening that happens. Did you guys know this? This, this first year of marriage... Uh, turns out um, it's not like you thought it would be. It's not like honeymoon, like extended. It's kind of like the honeymoon ends and then you hit real life. You guys know what I'm talking about? Anyone? Am I alone on this one? Okay. Some of you guys that you, you, you're still living the fairy tale or you just don't want to admit it in a public setting. That's fine. Uh, and what happens is, is you go through this thing and the reason why it's so tough is you are fully exposed. You guys know what I mean by, by fully exposed? Uh, it's like you put this front on Okay, it's not a front. It's a, you put your best self forward while you're dating. And, you know, and you think about the way you're going to propose. Like, how many of you guys put thought into how you're going to propose? You didn't just like, hey, you want to do this? <laughs> All right, so you thought about it. And then, uh, you, you know, and then, like, she tells stories about how awesome the proposal was. And then there's the wedding. And you, you know, God knows there's preparation that goes into that. I mean, a lot. And there's this part of what you're like, I don't care anymore. Just let's do this all right. Right? Like that, that's kind of where we go. And we get all this preparation goes into one day. And then after that one day, nobody thinks about anything beyond like two seconds from now because we're inundated with life. And life is happening so fast. And then all of a sudden, your reality of your sinfulness and your past issues come up and you're exposed. And then you can't, like there is no get out of jail free card, right? In fact, let me, I want to walk through with you kind of like, as we're talking about, we're going to talk a little bit about marriage, but that's not really where I'm going this morning. I just want to talk about relationship. It's bigger than that. In fact, um, when it talks to, when you talk about people that you don't know, that maybe you just see, in fact, maybe some of you are brand new today, you just walked in here, you sat down, you looked around, and there's a lot of people who you have no idea who they are. You don't know what's going on in their world, and nor do you care. I mean, not that, not that you're not a caring person, it's just that you don't know to care, and there's just other people with their own lives, in my own life, it's just a different world. And so my needs are unrelated to the relationship because we have none, okay? But then there's this movement that happens as you go from I have no idea who you are to stranger who's like sitting next to me and I'm stuck with you for 
an hour. And then it moves to acquaintance, because this is the people you work with. Like, you don't want to get, you know, across the lines. We keep it professional. That way it doesn't get weird. We don't do in-office dating. You know, a lot of that goes. And then, uh, and then there's this place where we get to this, we have relationship now, especially at the office, and it's, it's contractual. It's, we are looking for a win-win. In fact, people you do business with, you want win-win relationships. Because when I spend time with you, you're like, yay, you're providing me a service or you're providing me an experience and I'm enjoying it and that's a win for me, it's a win for you, great relationship. Now the problem with contractual relationships, well, first off, the, thing, the great thing about contractual relationships is that's what makes America go. Like if someone has a terrible product, you're like, no, nah, I'm done with you, I'm moving on because I'm no longer getting a win. That's what makes American economy run. But what happens is when we, train, when we take that sort of um, contractual relationship and we bring it into a relationship, what happens is when things go badly, you don't expect uh, your, you know, th- this is how we work with AT&T and Time Warner. How many guys do the AT&T Time Warner dance every year to get a new contract to renegotiate? Yeah, every year. You're like, so would you like to renew this contract and pay $30, $40 more than you did last year? You're like, no. And then you go over to AT&T and you're like, hey, Time Warner, they're a bunch of dirt bags. What can you do for me? And they're like, oh, we love you. We will give you super low introductory rate. And you're like, of course you are. And then a year from now, I'm going to say, no, of course I'm not going to stay with you. I'm going back to them because they're going to give me a super low introductory rate. And you just do that back and forth every year. Does that, anybody else do that? Okay, that's, that's how we roll. But what happens in a relationship with a person, when, you do a con- when it's contractual, what you're saying is when things get hard or you get frustrating or I find out you have a porn addiction, I'm out. Or I find out your debt is unbelievably arduous or that you got issues, anger manage- man- management problems or an addiction that is something I... I Listen, um, I didn't realize what I was getting into, and I said a whole bunch of vows. You know, I remember I, I said for better, what, what I meant was, when I said for better or worse, richer for poor, sickness and health was for better, richer, and in health. And you, I, I, I didn't really realize that there was an actual darkness part that I'm getting. Because that's what happens when we step into relationship and without forethought because we're in the fog of love. Am I right? You just wake up one day and I'm married. How did I get here? How did I get into this marriage? And that's what happens. And all of a sudden you realize that's where you're at. But the difference between a contractual relationship and covenantal relationship is this. And it's not during the good times. You guys know that, right? A contractual relationship and a covenantal relationship, when things are going really well, are exactly the same. No different. But what a contractual relationship says is like, I care as long as it benefits me. And the moment that it stops benefiting me, Yo, this relationship's toxic. I'm out. Which in some ways is very healthy when you're dating. Don't get in a toxic relationship. That's good. That's healthy. Leave that. But when you get married, you can't say, nah, you're toxic. I'm out. And there's this tendency for us to do that after we've kind of gone through the fog of love and we're exposed by our own sinfulness and the darkness of our hearts comes out and you get two toxic people together and you're like, why isn't this working? All right? And the reason is because we went into it with contractual attitude and all of a sudden we found out it's covenantal. And covenantal means this, I put the relationship first before my needs. In other words, I care as long as it benefits you. I care as long as it benefits you. And listen, when you're in a relationship like that, there's this tendency, you're like, well, why would anyone get into that? It's like a doormat relationship. I could just abuse that relationship. But that's what you're signing up for. In fact, um, here would be some really unromantic, um, you know, vows. Like if Adrian and I got married and we were like, listen, let's just be real. Yeah, because lo- that's what I love about like this generation. We're just real. So let, let man, if you're getting married, this is your vows. All right, ready? What you're gonna do is you're gonna get before the preacher guy. It might be me or somebody else, and you get there and you're like, "We're gonna be real," because I'm tired of all this fluffy, fake stuff. And then so you go, "I promise, I take you, Adrian, to be my wife for worser <laughs> and for poor." And in, even when you find out I have an issue with my re- way I relate to women, and there's a tendency I might have an affair and, you know, all that. All that, too. And there's a tendency that, you know, I might actually 
get sick and you'll be changing my bedpan five times a day. I mean, like, let's just be real and put that out there. I'm going to love you even if you, and then you fill in the blank of the dark place that you don't want to go. That, that's, that, that would be a really legit vows, wouldn't it? Because everybody does contractual vows, which are like, hey, as long as it's cool, we're doing well, I'm in. When it gets hard, yo, I'm out. And that's sort of what I wanted you to see this morning is because in, what's happened in our culture, because we have this really great thing of wonderful service. And, and here's what I mean by that. Um, it, restaurants do this really well. So uh, when I was growing up, uh, there, was this chi- there was this restaurant that had the best chili. It would make me think about chili. And like 10 years old, when I didn't, like, you don't even care about food because you just eat pizza all the time. You guys remember those days? And I thought about chili. And I was like, mmm, chili, I want to go eat at that restaurant. And it wasn't like chili is the restaurant. It was like a restaurant that served chili. And I would think about chili, and, and I would eat it, and I had so many amazing experiences. I would just go there, like, by myself as a 10-year-old and, like, walk there. Like, I have some lunch chili, please. You know, like, that, that's where I was. And one day, I was with my friend Matt, and, and I'll never forget it. My, my buddy Matt and I, we go to this restaurant. We both order chili, and we eat it, and we're like, mmm, chili, we love this place. And then I start having, like, Montezuma's Revenge in Texas, and uh, I don't know what happened, and I forgot every wonderful experience at that restaurant I ever had, and I made like this vow, I will never eat chili or anything from you again. You are dead to me, right? I did not feel sorry for them. It was a restaurant, and I stopped eating there forever. It was only one bad thing, right? Only one bad moment. And I think, I think, this is why it gets hard in marriages. is because we have seen that attitude with a lot of our life that once you are exposed, once you mess it up, once it's ruined, I'm out. In fact, we, we even do this with churches, right? I mean, you do your, it's like a church shop. And like the sermon, like, I'll give my, you know, he was sort of funny, but like the joke didn't land. He talked about fantasy football too much. And then, uh, and then, you know, like there's this thing, I just can't, I, I couldn't go there with him. It was a little bit too graphic. So I give him a B minus. Uh, the people were okay. That was kind of fun. And I think Grayson was off key a couple times. I don't know if I can handle that again. I don't know if I can come back to that. So overall, I'll give you a three star uh, just because people really greeted me really warmly. Okay, so like that's sort of how we do life. And that's how we do church. And the problem with that, if you do that, that's why you don't have friends later on because you never knew it was to fully give yourself to not a performance but to people. And I think that's that's the problem. We don't know what covenantal relationships are. And so this morning um, I want us to talk about the covenantal relationship and see what it is for us to do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than ourselves. That we take time, each one of us, to not look after our own interests, but to the interests of others. Primarily, the one that you made all these really great vows to. And I'm not just talking about your spouse. But I'm talking about your parents as they get older. I'm talking about your children as they, you spoil them. And I'm talking about just the relationship with people that are really annoying here at church. Because at some point, you're going to realize, you're going to be exposed that you got issues. And so do I. And we're a bunch of people with issues around here, trying to hang out and have fun together. But when you learn what it is to have covenantal love, to love somebody in spite of somebody, it will transform everything. So let's, let's get into this. We're going to be in God's word this morning. And remember, we've been in this series called After God's Own Heart. And uh, we're going to pick up the story. So David is now, we, when we left off last week, David uh, was sort of on the run. He was fugitive number one, FBI most wanted list. But what happens in the period of time where we left off is that David is going to become king because Jonathan and Saul die in battle against the Philistines. And so the the new anointed king, King David, rises to the throne. Now, there's something that you do when you become a king. This is just common practice among all ancient Near Eastern culture. And But before we get into that, if you don't have a Bible, would you do me a favor? Would you raise your hand in the air, wave it like you care, and a Bible will come to you? 
And if you don't have a Bible at all, this is our gift to you. We're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 9. That's going to be on page 260. These Bibles are passing out. Like I said, if you don't have one, borrow ours. If you don't have one at all, take this one home with you. And so we're on page 260, 2 Samuel chapter 9. And so we're setting this story up of David has become king. And what you do as a king is you start to, um, what's the right word for this? Take out, eliminate, eliminate any threat to the legitimacy as you as a monarch. So what that would mean is everybody from the old line, Saul, if Saul had any other kids other than Jonathan, Jonathan was taken out, so that took care of itself. Saul, Jonathan, any other of his family who might have some sort of claim on the throne, you would eliminate them so that later on in your reign, as the benevolent dictator that you are, you don't have issues of trying to, to quell riots and keep people on, in line. You just take care of that nip in the bud off the beginning. Now, which for our standpoint, like murder in general, is a bad thing. We think, oh, that's so bad because, well, it is. But in this culture, ancient Near Eastern culture, that was like what you did. So everyone's like, well, of course, just, you know, the thing that makes it nice, like we're going to do a quick execution. Oh, you're so cool. That's so nice. So that's where we're going to pick up the story of David is now on the throne and um, he's going he's gonna to be asking about Saul's line. Ready? Here we go. Second Samuel chapter 9. And David said, is there anyone left of the house of Saul? Now, Again, when you read that, you're like, oh, well, that's he's doing what monarchs do. He's bringing in from somebody from the house of Saul to take them out. And then he says this really weird thing, that I might show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. And maybe you're like, oh, he means kindness like the quick death kind. Like, oh, that's really nice of him. And then he's going to go on. He's like, he's at, he asks a general question to his court, and they scramble around to find, you know, get the king what he wants. He said, now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And they called him to David. And the king said to him, are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, is there no, still not some of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? Which again, you're like, what do you mean by kindness? Well, let me, let me help you out with this word. Because we're about to see this word three times. And like whenever you, you guys remember when, uh, at least in college, the, our professor would do the, one of these kindness. And that'd be like, write that down because it was on the test. Do you guys remember that? All right, so whenever you see this thing written three times, that's up. No, it's about to be said again. So what, what is kindness? Kindness is from the Hebrew word chesed. All right, so shall we all practice together? On the count of three, we're going to say chesed. All right, one, two, three. Chesed. All right, you got it. If you don't have a like you're hawking a loogie, you're not doing it right. All right, so chesed is this thing of covenantal love or unfailing love, steadfast love, kindness, mercy. That's the word that, you know, when you read kindness, it's not, that doesn't get the full depth of meaning. This is the love that God does his covenants with. Is there anyone that I can show God's chesed to? And this is a powerful word. And Ziba's like, yeah, I know a guy. There is still a son of Jonathan. And then he makes this interesting, weird note. He's crippled in his feet, kind of like, but you don't need to worry about him. I know you're going to do a quick kindness, but maybe you don't. He's just crippled. He's a crippled guy. Don't, he's not going to try and take over. Just leave him alone. And the king said to him, well, where is he? And he's like, um, you know, he's nowhere. He, that's what he literally says. He's in the house of Mocker, the son of Amiel, at Lodibar. Lodibar means essentially nowhere, no pasture. He's, he's just, you know, nowhere. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Mocker, the son of Amiel, at Lodibar, no pasture. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David, fell on his face, and paid homage. Now, I want, I want to just bring you the picture. Here's this kid. Or he's like 20. He's like 20 years old. And when he was five years old, that's when Saul and Jonathan died. And when the news got to the house of wherever uh, young Mephibosheth was living, his nurse grabs him to make a run for it because, of course, the next person to die is all the family of Saul. That's just, it's part of it. So they grab Mephibosheth, and as she's running, like she trips, and she wasn't like a Heisman athlete, and she drops Mephibosheth and breaks both his feet. And this is before the days of modern surgery, and this five-year-old is now club-footed. He's disabled. He's crippled. 
And so he's been through this before of when he's brought, you know, the, rem- the, re- the, re- the reminder of the fact that his father and grandfather who were like a king and a prince are now dead and now you will die just because of what you inherited of just simply being their son, their grandson. And so, and David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, behold, I am your servant. And then David can tell this guy is freaked out. I mean, he, he is just prostrate before him. You know, he, he brought his, you know, walking stool thingy. And, you know, because both feet, he can't put much weight on him. And he's just laying there in front of David. And David's like, hey, 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 don't fear. Don't fear. Look at me. Look at me. Don't fear. And then he says this. Here's this third time. For I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan and I will restore to you all the land of Saul your father and you shall eat at my table always now this is a big deal David sought to show covenantal covenantal love to Mephibosheth now let me explain this and this is the part where you, where we don't get this right is David and Jonathan were warriors. These guys went to battle together. And uh, for those of you who don't know, I, I led a company in combat. You know, where are my former military guys? Where are you guys at? Give me some love. Okay, there we are. You guys know um, what it's like to go to war with somebody. It, there's, a, there's a deeper sense of relationship. And, and um, because we're not a culture where everyone goes to war, this is not exactly something you get. Because there's friendships that you have with guys that you go to combat with that are different than guys you go to corporate America with. It's just different. And when you go to combat with somebody and, like, uh, you're about to get shot and you, like, take that guy out and you're like, hey, thanks. You know, there is a bond, right, that just sort of, like, created. And you keep on, on one of your breast pocket, like, you know, that, that letter home of, like, hey, take care. I love you. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about you, the very last thing I want to do, and you just picture your, of your kid or your wife or whatever, and you, you take it out, and as, you know, if you get the, a sniper neck shot, and you're like, the juggler's been hit, and you're kind of going, you pull that out, and you grab your battle buddy, and you're like, my man, make sure you take care of my boy. And that guy may die right there in the arms of his battle buddy, but that battle buddy takes that memory and it goes home with him. And so every time he sees that guy's son, he remembers that moment. It's like, it's like in your head and in your heart forever. And so you will do, you will give, you'll fund stuff that doesn't seem likely to fund something for somebody else's kid. You will love that kid because of the bond you had. So that's, it's, it's like that. It's one, they're, they're comrades of arms. But two, when Jonathan and David connected, they had this deep bond, not only of battle, but Jonathan had been given by God the sense that David would be the next king. And he, lo- he, he didn't fight it. He didn't mind that David would be the king, and he wouldn't. In fact, he was for David. And so when he says, listen, you are going to be the next king, but when you do, would you please Remember my family. And they make a covenant to one another saying, I will take care of your family. And so that's why David here is going like, is there anybody I can show kindness to for the sake of Jonathan? Because I made a covenant. Now listen to me. Nobody in Israel is going like, hey buddy, you remember that? You made a covenant with Jonathan, so you need to keep that. Everyone's like, bro, you need to kill off everybody because if you let somebody live, they're going to think you're weak. And if you're weak, how can you run a kingdom? This isn't like playing nice with people. This is where you're an authority. People want to take you out. You are a leader of God's kingdom. And so therefore, take measures in your own hand to further the kingdom. Let's not worry about a covenant that you have with a dead guy. But David's like, no, no, that's not how we roll. And this is why I love this. And this is what's so cool about And I'm about to go on a rant. Sorry, I'm going to do this. Um, this is what stinks for us today, men. And can I just talk to men for a second? We are terrible at having friends. Just awful. I'm going to say, we, you guys, we, we're just terrible. And here's what happens. The more, in fact, the more successful you get, can, can you guys with me? The less friends you have. 
and what happens is, is you start of like, there start, you start to kind of, instead of like, you have measuring contests for certain things, just kind of like, how do I measure up? And so you choose friends based on what they can get you as opposed on the covenantal relationship because it's hard to have that, it's hard to have that in a corporate setting. Way easier to have that in a combat setting. But what should be taking place in a church setting? Men, can I just, can we be real? You don't have friends because you're not willing to be vulnerable with somebody because there's this, always this fear that can I really trust that guy? Now, in college, we're all about it. We're friends. I love you, man, anything. But as you get older, priorities start to shift. Things happen. You start to shut down. And you don't have any covenantal relationships. And all of a sudden, you become an old man and have no friends. That's why you envy those old guys that sit around at IHOP and they just tell war stories for hours. You want to be that guy. You know who do do well at this? Or ladies. And I just want to share just a quick story on that. Um, so uh, you guys know that our church has a heart for adoption. There's, that's kind of one of the things that we're sort of all about is families taking in those who have been orphaned or those who have been um, unwanted or those who have been just uh, not at a place where they could have a family. And uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, the Deckers posted this on Facebook. We're having a girl. You know, it's a really cool thing. They, they had chose, uh, they had one biological son, uh, Brody, and they loved Brody. And they had a heart for adoption. And uh, they went through the process, spent a gajillion dollars, thousands and thousands of dollars to, you know, you have to have your home investigated. You have to, you know, there's lots of background things, and then you have to pay an agency, and it's a, you know, lots of stuff goes into it. Pay lots of money. So you invest monetarily, but then your heart gets sort of tied as you, you meet the birth mother, and, or you connect with the birth mother, and like the birth mother chooses you, and it's like, this is who I'm going to give my child to, and there's this beautiful, beautiful connection. And uh, over the past weeks, we've been celebrating. We were getting ready, and, and we were so excited for uh, Laura and Casey to take uh, Emma home. And then this week, uh, Adrian says, hey, things aren't going well with the birth mom. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, I don't know. I'm like, well, you either know that things are going well or they're not going well. It's not like a kind of I don't know. So, and the, so we kind of investigate that something was, they couldn't find a heartbeat. They were going to induce the baby, and then when they induced the baby, Emma came, stillborn. So all that time and all that energy, all the nursery, all the stuff, here it is, we're expectant, we're hopeful, this is our baby, and then it comes to a screeching halt. And uh, if you didn't know this, the women of our church are really, really connected, so like three seconds the entire church knew outside of Facebook, which is kind of a remarkable event. And Adrian, she, she texted uh, Lauren Stockman down at uh, Eastside Community Church. And if you're not familiar, we planted Eastside Community Church back in January. We sent a bunch of people down there to East Austin. And so they're another vibrant church in the city, which we're really excited about. But the covenantal relationship we have with them is very real and very powerful, very potent. And um, Lauren had recently gone through a failed adoption. And where her heart got broken because on the very last second, the um, birth mother, uh, essentially after the Stockmans had poured a bunch of money and paid for everything, all the health care, all the everything. And then she said the last second, no, no, I'm going to keep my baby. Thank you for paying for it. And uh, I want my child and there's nothing they could do. And so heartbreak and counseling and all this normal stuff that comes with that. And so as soon as... Uh, it wasn't like, hey, Adrian texted Laura. I was like, hey, can you go talk to Laura? You would probably have a great insight. I was like, hey, just FYI, uh, Laura lost her baby. And Lauren, within seconds, uh, sends a text to one of her friends at Eastside Community Church, Jenny, and says, take my baby, Claire. I'm heading up to Wells Branch. And, like, didn't really invite herself, just knocks on the door, says, I need to be here. God kind of prompted in her heart, and Laura and Lauren just sat together on the couch and just cried together for a while. Because that's what covenantal people do. Your hurt becomes my hurt. I care as long as it benefits 
you. And that's the heartbeat of the gospel and what David was trying to show to Mephibosheth. But here's, here's the reality of where Mephibosheth was. is When he hears David say this, it's, we live in a contractual world. The world doesn't operate with that kind of love. And so his response is this. And he, Mephibosheth, paid homage and said, What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I. Why would you do it? Listen, because Mephibosheth expected David to treat him like a dead dog. Because that's what you do with your rival family line. You get rid of them like a dead dog. They can go into the trash heap. We need to incinerate so no, you know, fleas or germs or bacteria gets more exposed. We need to do it. I'll be kind to you. I'll make it quick. I won't torture you. We'll just make this thing happen. But David does the exact opposite. He doesn't just let him live. He's saying, you're coming to my table. And this, this is what, Dave, what Mephibosheth expects is um, he expects restaurant treatment. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to put it this way. There's a certain restaurant which, which the name shall be re- remain unnamed. And it's right next to the Live for More Center, if you know where that is. And it's, a, and it's a Mexican restaurant, okay? And who has spent an hour waiting for your bill there? Come on, admit it. Yeah, all of us have. And so there comes a point where it's like, restaurant that shall not be named, you are dead to me. I'm going to Ramos number three. I'm out. And so that's what happens. That's what everyone expects. Mephibosheth, you bring nothing to the table. The only thing you bring to the table is bad service, and it, there's a chance you could try to overthrow me. You're done. But that is not what David does. In fact, watch. Watch David go on. The king is then going to provide for him. Watch. Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, All that belonged to Saul and all his house I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. And then watch this. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson shall always eat at my table. Now watch this. Eat at my table. Remember I said if if it's three times, you better highlight, underline, and take note of this. Watch this. Shall eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord, the king commands the servant, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem for he always ate at the king's table now why did they make this is like yo man writer um i'm all for being very clear you want to make sure that we understood that he ate at the king's table i got the first time and like and he's like i'm gonna be a little bit redundant that's number two why is he making such a big deal about the king's table and this last line of chapter 13 is gonna blow your mind you ready you ready for this uh, this is like the part where you should you this is worth the price of admission here we go verse 13 and this random comment now he was lame in both his feet. And you're sitting there going like, all right, thanks for that little tidbit. But the part you may not know is that when David sought to take over Jerusalem, David had you know, he'd become king and he was looking to kind of establish himself. Uh, he wanted to make his, put his palace in Jerusalem because it was the most easily defensible place. The problem with that is you had to take out the guys that were defending it. And they were the Jebusites. And so he says, hey, to the Jebusites, I'm going to take you guys over. You either can come peacefully or I'm going to have to, you know, blow you guys up. And the king and his men, this is from 2 Samuel 5, and the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites who said to David, you will not come in here. And they have this weird line. But the blind and the lame will ward you off. In other words, you guys are so weak, blind and lame people can take you out. And that infuriates David. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David, and David said on that day, whoever would strike the Jebusites, let him get up the water shaft to attack the lame and the blind. It's like, you call me lame? I'll call you lame and blind. 
Yeah! Like, you tell him, David. <laughs> Let him get up the water shaft to attack the lame and the blind who are hated by David's soul. Like, like, like he took that a, a insult like to the core of who he was, and it was like, remember the Alamo? Remember what they said about us? Get them all. I mean, like, that's kind of where he was. And then therefore, he made, it was such a big deal to David. He said, therefore it was said, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. And the house was the palace. Except unless you're David's son. We make exceptions for sons, don't we? Everybody else has to play by the rules, except for my kid. You see, David treated Mephibosheth like one of his sons for the sake of Jonathan. Now, I want you to take this in. Mephibosheth's like 20 years old, and at the king's table is like David at the head. You've got Absalom, uh, you know, who's got some gorgeous hair, and he's like taking selfies, like, What's up? What's up? That's the king's table. And then you've got uh, Solomon. He's, you know, he's like, he's on the iPad reading Wikipedia. You know, just like, nah, nerding out, nerding out. This is some, man, have you seen the botany? This is such incredible stuff. Botanical gardens, baby. Let me get some of that. Like there's, there's Solomon. He's like, there's the elite of all of Israel. All the best dressed, all the most athletic, all the king's sons who are good looking people, who don't need anything about ADA compliance. And then all of a sudden, as they're sitting at the table waiting to be fed, you could hear this. As Mephibosheth slowly makes his way to the table and he comes up to this entire crowd And he looks up, and there's Solomon. There's Absalom looking awesome. There's all these guys that would be so intimidating to walk into a room of, let alone be at the table with, when they know you're not one of theirs, but the king has adopted him. And so Mephibosheth keeps his eyes fixed on David, who has a dad face on. You guys know what I'm talking about with dad face? That's my boy. You come on. You come on. This is your place at the table. And so Mephibosheth locks on, staring at his adoptive dad who has invited him to be at his table where the blind and the lame were not allowed unless the king changes the rules just for him, for the sake of Jonathan. And so I want you to see this because David is the most famous guy of the Old Testament. And Jesus, when he shows up on the scene, they don't compare him to Moses. They compare him to David. And people say, son of David, have mercy on me. And I wonder, whenever they said that, was it just like David, you're at the table with all your sons and your kingdom. And there's, I am, who am I? I'm blind and I'm lame. Have mercy on me, a sinner. I'm just a dead dog. And Jesus says, come. See, God the Father treats you like a son. Treat you like a daughter for the sake of what Jesus did for you on that cross. And that's why we sing the songs. And that's why we get all emotional. And that's why we live our lives differently because something happened. We went from dead dog to a son or daughter of the king. And so my question this morning is how do you view yourself? Are you a dead dog? kind of looking around at all the other people who you feel like they've got it together. They're just really good at covering it up. So just in case you were wondering. I mean, just like when you look at everybody else's Facebook, you're just like, man, their life looks so great. No, that's just what they're putting forth. That's the image. Come on. They're just as broken as you are. And what I'm wanting from this church is for us to be understanding that our issues are real. We bring nothing to the table but our brokenness and our lameness. But we've got a father who is so excited to adopt us as one of his sons because of what Jesus did. And so this morning, where are you? 
In fact, I, I wonder if some of you are just kind of stuck in dead dog mode because, like, you don't want to give up control. You're like, okay, I, hey, I'm a dead dog. I got it, but at least I'm my own dead dog. I don't, just, I don't be at somebody else's table. I'm at my own table. And it might be crumbs, and it might be like I'm starving, and I'm broken, and I'm lame. But there's a sort of a pride in that. And the Father saying, come to my table. I made you. I love you. You are meant to sit with me. I loved you so much. I sent my only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for you. And he rose from the dead to show that he conquered death in the grave. And you come! with all your brokenness and your lameness and all the things that are so. And for the sake of my son, Jesus, I will provide for you for the rest of your days for eternity. And you will live in the house of the Lord forever. So this morning, um, we're going to be baptizing. Ari's going to be uh, sharing her life with us for a brief second or two and because of what Jesus has done for her at a very young age. She said, Jesus, I bring all my brokenness. I bring all my stuff, all the, all the issues that I have. I bring it to you. Take me as I am. And the thing I love about this, she's saying, I got nothing to bring to the table. I got nothing but my own little life. And it doesn't matter if you're eight years old or 80 years old, what, ha- what Jesus did for you on that cross applies to you. And so my hope and my cry of my soul is that you would give your life to him. So this morning, if you're not a Christian, would you consider believing the fact that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and he rose from the dead so you could have access to the Father? And if you are a Christian, would you walk in that truth? Not walk around like a dead, defeated dog, but walk around like a son or daughter of the king who has access to the Father of and the king of the whole world, the whole universe. And so we live and we love in light of what's been done for us. We got mercy. And that's why we treat our spouse with mercy. That's why we treat our children with mercy. That's why we treat our parents with mercy. That's why we treat the people at our church with mercy. And that's why we treat people beyond these doors with mercy because it's been shown to us when we didn't deserve it and we brought nothing to the table. The only thing you bring to the table is your brokenness and your need. And Jesus takes it from there. Would you guys pray with me? Father, I'm so excited about understanding the depth of this covenantal love that's beyond a contract, that's beyond a uh, service obligation, but rather it's just stepping into a relationship with you where you show us your love. And God, if we could have a, a heart like yours, where because of all the love that's been shown to us, we would show it to others. And we would bring our Mephibosheth Ness and you would take it, invite us to the table and give us this joy. And we would just start bringing invites everywhere we go for people to join us at the table saying, hey, there's room for you to come. God, I'm praying that somebody here might respond to this and come to the table. And I'm praying that those who know you would so go and start bringing others to the table. We love you, Jesus. Empower us with your Holy Spirit that we can do and follow you according to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Just imagine for a second, if we stop taking uh, our contractual service provider relationship that works really well in American retail. And we stop taking it to our relationships that says, I will only give you me if you give me the best of you. Imagine what would happen if we love covenantally the people we make covenants with. Imagine what would happen with our spouse if we said, I'm going to be with you come hell or high water. Imagine with our children what the love would look like. It says, I'm going to love you in spite of you, even with our parents and our in-laws and even the people you're sitting next to here. Imagine if we just didn't look at the people as disposable or maybe another opportunity might come up might give me a little bit better service but we invested deeply 
it would change not only your family. It wouldn't just change Wells Branch. It wouldn't just change Austin. That kind of thing changes the world. So let's go. Would you receive the benediction? Go. And be a people of a covenant that looks at others with God's eyes. Go and be a people who love, expecting nothing in return. Go and be a people who don't live as dead dogs, but live as kings, sons and daughters. Go and push back the darkness and have an awesome week of worship. Here's Smith.